because we had a lot of experience dealing with distressed properties, we were kind of the management company of choice, whether it be on the commercial or the multifamily side, because we knew kind of how to tackle distressed real estate, having done so much work for a lot of these banks. So. Welcome to the Wild West Real Estate Podcast. And now, here's your host, Mark Hinteman. Today's guest is a multifamily broker and property manager in Sunbelt markets that include the Florida Panhandle and the Gulf states. I'd like to welcome Brian Estes. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I'm, I'm eager to get into your story. So yeah, tell me a little bit about your background and then how you got into real estate. All right. Well, perfect. Yeah. I kind of grew up in the business. My father owned an insurance agency and he bought and, and rented out low-income houses. And so I guess I got my start to remodeling houses when I was younger and painting and making some money and <clears throat> went to college and decided to major in accounting and uh, went to work for a private company in Jackson and hated every day I was there and Realized that I really enjoyed the real estate market a lot better than I thought I would. So I quit and my wife didn't like it, but I did quit and decided <laughs> I was going to buy and flip houses for a living. So it, that did not go over very well. It didn't. <laughs> How old were you when you quit? Uh, your job? Probably about 24, 25. Okay. Just got married. I mean, probably within six months. <laughs> Everybody thought I was on the fast track to get my CPA and really doing some great things in that industry. But I realized early, I was very fortunate to realize early I was not a corporate person, that I really liked the autonomy of my own position, things that I can control and things that I can improve. And I did not like that corporate culture of where everybody has to come together and, and everybody has to do their small part of a much bigger project. And it just didn't really appeal to me. Yeah, that's interesting. So you had clearly an entrepreneurial bug. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When I do it all yourself and and your first steps were flipping. They were. Yeah. We bought a few houses and we did rent the first two houses out. I say we, I brought in one of my good friends to kind of help. And so we bought the first two houses together, rented them out. And then I recognized that people were starting to flip houses. This is back. You got to mean, this is back in the mid nineties when most people didn't even really know what Flipping, I don't think they called it flipping houses at the time. Right. It just, you know. And you were in Jackson, Mississippi? Most everything I did early on was in central Mississippi, mostly in Jackson. Okay. What kind of prices were you paying back then? Oh, gosh. Just out of curiosity. Uh, <laughs> this is going to shock envious. you in California. It's going to shock you in California. But yeah, we were paying anywhere from twenty five dollars to $40,000 for houses. Okay. Yeah, and, I grew up in Ohio. Okay. So yeah, that was kind of... Yeah. That was kind of the price of an average house back then. <clears throat> yeah. And so I was doing a lot of the work myself and renting it out. And I decided that I would try to flip a few houses and we did and made instant money. And that kind of really spurred a lot of other things. So we were flipping houses at the time and then reinvesting our equity back into buying houses for long-term rental. Can I ask you, what were the metrics back then? You know, what do they look like on a $25,000 house? We were averaging probably anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Now we once we got into flipping, we were buying a little bit higher. In, when I say higher end, we were buying eighty, ninety thousand dollars. Our goal was to always make twenty percent of the value of the the ultimate value of the house. So in other words, if we sold a hundred thousand dollar home, once we retail it for a hundred, we were our goal was to make twenty. You know, okay. so if we were flipping a fifty thousand dollar house. Our goal would be to make ten. That was just kind of a roundabout way of just kind of building in a certain amount of profit. What we thought was certainly risk, you know, was worth the risk. I guess. Okay, and that would include acquisition. You know, you'd put rehab. some. Obviously, you'd rehab <clears> the whole <throat> thing and then sure. sell it and and net of all fees. You absolutely target. And then on top of that, we did make a little extra money because there were a lot of 
parts of the job that we did not outsource, like painting and some other things, demo. I always loved demo day, you know, and we did a lot of the yard work ourselves. And so <laughs> we did pay ourselves a little bit on top of the 20% that we would make on flipping the house. So you said you made a little bit, but were you kind of turning that into a business? Because nowadays it sounds like you're you're vertically integrated and that's become yes. part of your model. Yeah, and at the time we were, I was young and, and I didn't realize that that was, you know, I was paying myself and you're right. I mean, that was really more of us than it was passive income. But at the time I did not have a full-time job. I, I quit my W-2 job, as I mentioned. So at that time, I probably didn't care whether it was considered, you know, investor income or business income. I just needed money to survive, to live off of, but also needed money to buy the next house. And so anywhere we could get, you know, the equity or the money, you know, to put down as a down payment on our next house, we didn't really work, care where it was coming from. Uh, sure. And where yeah. did it come from? Did you have investors back then? None. Yeah, it, it was, all came from my own pocket. I mean, my folks were very supportive of me quitting, but at the same time, you know, you made your bed, now you've got to lie in it. So I knew I was kind of on my own at the time. I, I was either going to make it, you know, as a real estate investor, I was not. And so I, I had some real motivation behind me to make it work. Yeah. And you had this money. Is this from the accounting firm or you had some uh, savings? I had a little bit in savings, not much. Okay. I mean, whatever I had in savings, I blew pretty much on the first house. So that's <laughs> really kind of one of the reasons why I got pushed to the flip model, probably more than the long-term rental is that, you know, I realized to scale, I was going to need equity. I was going to need money. And the long-term rentals were great, but back then it wasn't as easy to go in and burr your way through a lot of real estate. I mean, back then the banks were eager to loan you money, but they weren't eager to cash out refinance either. So it wasn't as easy of a model to go in there and fix a property up, re have it reappraised in a year, and then pull my equity back out. Like I said, there just weren't as many financing options back then. Sure, sure. Leverage, it was hard to lean on the leverage to help you get through these projects. Absolutely. And so after renting a few houses, I realized if I was going to scale up and really do this in a bigger way, that I was going to need to flip some of these houses to be able to survive and make enough money to continue buying. Sure. Yeah. You had to unload some of them. I did. And some that we bought for rental, we decided to flip once we lost the first tenant, you know, <clears throat> because we'd done such a great job in the house of praise for much more than we ever thought it would once we made the repairs. And we realized, well, golly, now that the tenant has moved out or didn't renew, this is a great opportunity to put it on the market and just sell it. And so we did a lot of that early on as well. Okay. Did that sort of spark your entry into just flipping it and oh, yeah. cashing out yeah. on those? <laughs> man, when I, I walked away, probably the first house we flipped with about $15,000. And I mean, man, I thought I had hit the jackpot. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, we squander that much money now. I mean, it's just crazy, you know, but I say squander, you know, I say that within tongue in cheek, but you know, if you're in gold bonus, you can't help but to hear about these 15 and 20, $25,000 vacations. And we certainly do that as well. But back then, $15,000 profit on a house was a lot of money for me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was back in the 90s. What? -90s. Where did, how did you progress from there? Well, I decided that well, I, I kept progressing. I, I Probably by the time I was 28, I had owned about 79 rental homes. And I'd probably flipped another 400 homes, which at the time I thought was a lot of houses. And now I'm hearing about people that are flipping thousands of houses. But but I did wear out. I don't think there's any question that you get to a point where, you know, 78 single family houses is a lot. And it's a lot to manage. <clears throat> and I just got flat worn out. And uh, Yeah, was ahead. that part of like you needed systems, you needed some help and you needed to build a business, basically. You can't do that yeah. on your own. And so at the time I decided that I was going to unload, I unloaded about half of my houses to a couple of investors. And then I took that equity and I put it into shopping centers and multi-tenant office buildings and okay. just to kind of give myself a breather and to have some what I deemed at the time a little bit more passive type of real estate, which shopping centers and office buildings aren't necessarily passive, but they're probably a lot more passive compared to single family residential. 
Right. And were you still self-managing those? Everything I've done is pretty much self-managed. You've never you outsourced a third party? I have outsourced a few times uh, when I've gotten into certain deals that I didn't feel like I was the best person and I thought someone was better at it than yes. I did outsource a few times. Okay. And so you started in the 90s. You, you certainly went through the, the dot-com crash and where were you in 08? Like, what were you doing at the well, time and, and how did that impact you? Sure. Yeah. Well, right before 08 is I was still buying commercial and uh, we were still managing a lot of our residential portfolio, but I got noticed by a lot of other investors with a lot more money than I did. And they all say, Hey, look, you've done a great job buying on your own for your own portfolio. Could you help us acquire property for our portfolio? And so I realized, well, golly, some of these commissions are you know, $50,000, $100,000. And so I said, well, certainly. And so that's kind of how I got into the third party brokerage and management business was I had a couple of key friends or I was introduced to people who really went on an acquisition hunt and they wanted to acquire property, but they didn't want to manage it. And so that's really kind of how I got into the third party brokerage and management business was buying for other people. Okay. And so that kind of led me to 08, right? So when 08 happened, I had a pretty good size brokerage management company, as well as I was partners in a lot of real estate myself. And 08 was tough. I mean, I always tell people all the time that if you didn't have problems in 08, you probably weren't really in real estate, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I say that there were a lot of people who thrived in 08 and 09, but yeah, we had some problems and I had a lot of clients who had problems and especially the portfolios that were purchased within a year or two of the, the downturn, right. obviously those were the most leveraged. And, you know, I tell people all the time that I remember four mortgage companies, we had four mortgage companies in three of our properties that we had just in that Jackson area. And all four of them went out of business within a month of each other. Really? And I had two real estate companies, residential real estate companies that were tenants of ours that went out of business. And I mean, we all of a sudden as a portfolio, we were sitting at 94% occupancy. And then within a matter of three months, we were sitting around 65%. So it hurt us. And yeah. it hurt a lot of clients of mine too. So now what caused the vacancy spike? Was it, you know, tenants moving out or evictions or just people stopped yeah. paying? Uh, well, tenants moving out, you know, when the 08 crash came in, I mean, the mortgage companies couldn't, it wasn't anything to finance. And then the real estate companies, it was like somebody turned off the spigot for residential home sales overnight. And so a lot of the tenants that were unfortunately being fueled by 05, 06, 07 economy were also yeah. the ones that really felt it when the 08 crash happened and there were just no transactions that were happening. Okay. Transactions for, for residential and commercial. And commercial. And you mentioned right. tenants. So did you experience like, you know, I went through 08 and I distinctly noticed that uh, there was a major move down from like A class to B class, B and C class. And the buildings that I had that were in that B and C class unexpectedly thrived during that time because, yeah. and I don't know if it was in the location that I was in, but uh, I don't know. Did you experience that? You're right. <clears throat> there was a lot of flight to affordability. And if somebody was in an A space, whether it be commercial or residential, and their point of survival was to downgrade to a less expensive apartment or a less expensive office or a less expensive retail store, then that's what they did. Right. Uh, because uh, it was about surviving. And I mean, I knew people who had very nice offices who fired half their staff and downgraded to a B-class office and was able to survive, but that's what they had to do. You know? Right. And what was somewhat unique to 08 was the foreclosure, the massive uh, wave of foreclosures and all those people were becoming tenants. They were. And they were entering the apartment space. Yeah. Luckily I had pivoted a little bit in 08 to doing more lender oriented work. And so, you know, from an investor, from an investment standpoint, I didn't buy a whole lot in 09 and 2010, but I was able to get in with a lot of the banks and on the commercial side, we call them CMBS market, sure. commercial mortgage backed security, which a lot of apartments were financed in, but, but they were taking properties back, you know, left and right. And so I was very fortunate enough to be able to get 
into a lot of that work. And so although traditional sales weren't necessarily happening on the commercial side, we were doing a lot of lender oriented work where either properties were being foreclosed or it was, there were court appointed receivers that were in place of the owners that were demanding the properties being sold. Yeah. Could you speak to that? That's fascinating. I remember yeah. that. And how did that work? Like, yeah, there was these banks you described, these banks were suddenly had to take back a ton of properties and, you know, they became the REO, like, right? REO it market. Did. It seemed like from my vantage point, I was not the beneficiary or, or an investor in that space. I didn't have those relationships with banks, but how did that work? How did those people like yourself either had those pre-existing relationships or built those <clears> and then you know, we're taking those properties off the books for the lenders. Well, I say a little bit is dumb luck. I had a asset manager came to town to look at a really large office building that they had foreclosed about a year before. The current management company was not doing a very good job. And he called on a sign that I had not terribly far from the property, you know, that he was, uh, that their bank had. And so he called me one day and wanted information and you know, being from Mississippi, right? People here really don't like sharing a lot of information, but, you know, I kind of always consider myself more of a regional brokerage company and a management company and not somebody that's just local. So of course I took his call and I helped him out and he invited me to lunch and we went to lunch together. And then he finally told me what property it was. And it was a hundred thousand square foot class A office building. And at that time it was probably the largest property I'd ever had the opportunity to manage. And it was strictly from a relationship that someone called off of a sign and I was willing to help this asset manager from Kansas City. And so that led into having other projects in Mississippi and wind up getting projects outside of my market that they also took back or needed a court appointed receiver. And so that's really how I got into the distressed real estate market. Okay. And so, yeah, it was, I hate to say it was by chance, but it was both by chance and the fact that I was willing to help and work with somebody that wasn't from here. And so I really kind of set myself up to really be in that market. Uh, yeah. It seems like maybe not everybody recognized the opportunity that was there. You know, obviously exactly. a lot of people were going through pain. There was a lot of disruption, massive disruption back in oh, 08, yeah. but uh, there was also opportunities like these banks had way too many properties. They didn't know what to do with all of them. It sounds like you became a man, a go-to manager for them. Did you end up acquiring some of those? I never bought the properties I sold for them, but I have on other banks. Yeah. You know, I'm the listing broker. I try not to wear both hats. If I, oh, sure. if I decide I'm going to represent them and sell their property and dispose of it, then that's what I do. But I've been able to use the experience that I have working with the banks to my benefit. And so there are times that I'm not representing the bank that, yeah, that we're, that we've been able to take advantage of some really good opportunities. That's great. Great. Yeah. Fascinating. I don't get to dig <laughs> into 08 very much with interview people, I guess. Yeah. Well, you and right, me are getting around around long enough, We're right? getting old. <laughs> Nobody can remember it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and was, yeah, I, and I am amazed at how many people I meet that have really made millions over the last couple of years that weren't even in real estate in 08 and 09. So it is kind of fascinating, right? Yeah, I would think that like every vast majority of the <laughs> investors that I interact with were, you know, maybe in grade yeah. school or something when 08 was happening. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's cool. So you survived and you came I out survived. of that. Did you survive everything? You know, people have always asked me, like, how did you do in 08? I'm like, I did pretty well, like comparatively. I thought I did phenomenally, but uh, like, yeah. they're like, did you lose anything? And I'm like, the only thing I did, so I probably had, and I don't want this to be about me, but <laughs> I probably yeah. had about 15 multifamily businesses, multifamily properties in 08. Yeah. And luckily they were workforce housing. And I, like we described, I was the beneficiary of people moving down from a class and also people getting foreclosed on and they were becoming renters. So most of my properties were staying full, but I made the mistake of trying to flip a property in probably 09 and 10. 
And, and yeah, I did my first flip and it was a pretty big one. Cause actually I was going to live in the house. It was a house that I was going to move my family into. And then I changed my mind. I'm like, I don't want a long commute. So I was like, all right, I'll flip it. I got like the crew and we're going to go in and, and we're going to make this thing, this place amazing. And, and we did, and it was fun. It was my first flip and pretty much only flip, but we got caught by the double dip. Do you remember back in like we started to recover in 10 in like yeah. 2010 and then we went back down into a double dip and that's when i finished my project and you know i think it was literally a $700,000 flip for my first one and i think i ended up losing $5,000 oh, so wow. Wow. nothing major it was a great experience it was worth the education <laughs> but you yeah. know th- knock on wood over the course of a 4 year sort of like one of the historic downturns oh, yeah. that, that was the only <clears throat> sort of carnage I experienced. Yeah. You know, I was very fortunate in 08 and 09 to not lose anything, but what's funny is when I talked to other people, we had the same conversation and what I did have, which really probably cost me as much money as anything. I had legacy problems and anybody that went through 08, 09, who also had the same thing, said the exact same way. So the problem is when everybody else was buying in 2010 and 11 and all the great deals were coming on, I was still putting out fires in my portfolio. You know, I had partners that were with my father being one of the main partners. And honestly, you know, he had a really, really tough time coming through 08. He had a lot of speculative land and condos and all that kind of stuff that just plummeted in value. Well, you know, when the banks made capital calls for us to pay our notes down, you know, I got stuck paying a lot of that money, you know, instead of my partners. And so instead of being able to take a lot of advantage of a lot of opportunities in 2010, I was still right sizing my portfolio that I currently had. Yeah. And so we did take some advantage of opportunities, but there were a ton that I couldn't take advantage of because I needed to stay as liquid as I could because anybody that went through that knew that the banks, when you had these commercial mortgages, commercial loans that where you got a loan that was coming up all the time, they wanted a principal reduction. That was how the banks got through the crash as well as that they were trying to reduce their allocation to commercial real estate. And the way they did it is agreeing to renew your note, but they wanted a five or 10% principal reduction. So if you owed a million dollars, they were quite honestly wanted a $50,000 to $100,000 principal reduction and they would just renew your note. And so not until they took all my liquidity, did they stop asking for it. So. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Yeah. I experienced that as well. And, and they were resizing their lending portfolios and they were adjusting the values downward. And so the debt coverage ratios, they wanted that to get lower too. Sure. So yeah, I got, you know, some of those notices and that's a great point is, you know, coming out of 08, there was a ton of opportunity, but there were so many investors that were still recovering and, you know, it was a hindrance to taking advantage of some of those great opportunities because, you know, if you're dealing with a portfolio, you got to come out of that. You got to survive 08 before you could (laughs) take advantage of the bright opportunities. That's right. Yeah. And so anyway, it's, you know, and I think that, you know, when we go through this again, I think some of the people that some of the investors who've not had to experience this are going to experience the same thing. It's going to go through. Yeah. That's why I love talking about it because it's all going to happen again. Absolutely. I mean, when people all the time talk to me and they're younger than I am and which I love by the way, but, but when they always say, well, if the things don't go well, I'll just go and I'll refinance. And I I laughed and I chuckled because (laughs) I mean, anybody that went through 08 and 09 realized that when you need access to money and you're, I don't care if you're 40% leveraged and if you need money out of your property, when the, when the crap hits the fan, good luck, that's not going to happen. Right. Not going to cash out, refinance you when they're in the middle of the banks are in the middle of a crisis of an issue in a crisis. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to find a bank that's going to allow you to cash out refinance. So you're not going to be able to tap into all that equity that you think you can tap into. And the only way you know that is have already gone through it. You know, right. and realize yeah. that's, yeah, it's great when times are good. Banks love to loan you the money to tap into your equity, but when there is a crisis on hand, good luck. They're not doing it. Yeah. The banking environment completely changes. And back then, 
you know, everything froze up. Nobody could get loans. And, you know, out here in Southern California and countrywide, there was multiple of these huge <clears throat> lenders, biggest lenders in the country just collapsed and yeah. went out of business. Yeah, absolutely. And anyway, I always just tell people in the good thing I love about GoBundance that we're part of is that, yeah, you know, people are saying now, now is the time to access your lines of credit. Now is the time to do all of that because people who have been through it recognize that liquidity means everything. And it's too late to be thinking about liquidity when the crisis has already happened. Right. Right. That's great. Yeah. I love it. So coming out of that, what happened? What'd you do next? Well, we started buying again. And of course I had my third party commercial and multifamily management companies that were up and operational. And we took advantage of a lot of clients that were out there buying. And we, because we had a lot of experience dealing with distressed properties, we were kind of the management company of choice, whether it be on the commercial or the multifamily side, because we knew kind of how to tackle distressed real estate, having done so much work for a lot of these banks. So Yeah, that's great. And property management, I've managed some of my own, but mostly I use third-party property management. It's so hard. It's such a grind. How do you survive that and, and manage to enjoy that? You must have good systems and you must have a good team. Yeah, we do have good, very good teams. And that's really the only way I could do it. You know, I, I like to say I'm a very good asset manager, but I'm a terrible property manager. And luckily we've got a lot of good people that that's what they're good at. They're and, good at the grind. They're good at putting systems in place. And that's what you have to have. I mean, you have to have a system for everything, right? You have to have a system for collections and accounting. And how do you collect rent? How do you treat people that have past due balances? You know, how do you lease property, you know, and, and how do you do it on the multifamily side is completely different than the commercial, not just because of fair housing, but just because commercial tenants are different. And, you know, how do you treat past due tenants? And so, but yeah, you know, I'm really good at the asset management side. I can look at a property and generally can say, all right, if we want to go from here to here, here, here are the things that need to happen. Here's how you improve performance and here's how you cut expenses. But you really have to have good staff as well. And you have to have people that really understand how to deal with vendors. You have to have people that understand really how to get out there and lease property and identify tenant profiles. And so, yeah, it it's... You know, I always tell people the profit margin on a management company is not, it's not a lot. I mean, if you, if your management company is properly staffing to manage your property, then there's not a lot of money left over in the end for a huge profit. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a, a tough business and you need a great team. <clears throat> and it is. Yeah. And like you're saying that the profit margins are narrow. So it's, you can't pay those, your team a lot of money. So it's kind of gold when you find good people. Is that to your experience? It is, absolutely. And you've got to keep them. And, uh, you know, we pay our people pretty well, we think. But yeah, for what they do. And, you know, we laugh all the time because, you know, the brokers get sometimes six-figure commissions. And the same client that'll pay a six-figure commission will hire the cheapest property manager he can find. And I'm thinking, <laughs> man, it's so, that's so bass backwards, right? I mean, it's just kind of like, I mean, right. it's like you would think you would want the best property manager to manage your property because they're the ones that are going to move the needle on the occupants here. They're the ones that are going to move the needle on on saving your saving you money and cutting your expenses, but cutting the right expenses, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you don't want them just cutting expenses, you know, for a short-term gain, but a long-term issue. So you want them cutting it at the right time, but they'll shop around and compare shop with on their management companies which is crazy to me because anybody can be a property manager or call themselves a property manager. And, right. And we're an AMO company, which is, which our company actually has a designation. AMO stands for accredited management organization. And so we've got three certified property managers on staff, including myself. And so, you know, we're not everybody's property management company, but for serious investors who really want to pay us and pay us well, but also want to pay for performance, then we're the best choice. If people call us and they're just looking for the most inexpensive property manager they can find, then we're not for them. I mean, we do get paid well, but we also get paid to manage properties for people and to move the needle and people who really want their properties operating at optimal performance. 
So do you find that some management companies are geared in, it sounds like your own are geared towards value add and are are (laughs) exceptionally skilled in the value add process where there's other management companies that they just want to, they just want to collect rents and pay bills. Yeah. That's a great point. And absolutely. Yeah. I think that you want a management company that knows how to get the renovations done, right? You want management company that understands the market so well that they understand where the value is. They understand that that it's very realistic to put $1,500 a unit into a multifamily and you know that you're going to be able to raise rents $150 a month, you know, so you've got to have a management company that's very in touch with the market and very in touch with what's the possibility of when you spend the money. And a lot of times it's not all, I always explain to clients, it's not all in the the rent bumps. It may just be that you just get a better quality of tenant and you get a lot longer stay and you're over the next five years, rather than running at 93% occupancy, you're going to run at 97%. You know, so there's a lot more to the value add component than just bumping rents. Yeah, that's a great point that I don't hear very often. But yeah, you don't always have to just jack up the rents. And, you know, when the economy goes south, you're not going to be able to. Exactly. But there's a lot of other ways to make money in the niches, I guess. Like, you know, just reducing expenses and just taking a close look at everything that you're doing and you could kind of be more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you just get a better quality of tenant and that usually results in a lot longer longevity of stay, right? And rather than having tenants that are turning every 18 months or two years, maybe you're getting three to four year stays. And that makes a huge difference on the bottom line that maybe it's not the top line revenue, but there's no doubt that I mean, anybody will tell you that they're in a get a lot of boost in NOI when you don't turn units. I mean, sure. it's just, you know, so. Absolutely. What do you look for when someone applies? Like what what are sort of signals to you that this is either a good or a bad application? Uh, I guess you're referring to if a client comes to us to manage the property. Or a tenant. It, oh, actually, cool. I was like uh, leasing. If you're leasing a building, what, what are the yeah. red flag? Are there any sort of unexpected or unlikely red flags? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we always, we, most of what we do, I, mean, I say most of all of what we do is market rate apartments. We don't do any form of tax credit management. So that would be a little bit of a different scenario there. But in the market rate world, we kind of have our, you know, we want, we want to see that someone's employed. We want to see that the rent, you know, is at least, you know, a certain acceptable range. I don't want to get into the ranges, but it's acceptable range of what they're making per month, right? You know, so we, we do sit down with our clients and we do formulate, <clears throat> we've got to decide what's an acceptable tenant based on your parameters. Is it they make three times rent? Is it two and a half times rent? Is it they've got to be at their job from a certain time frame? We run criminal background checks. So there's all kind of, and, and it sometimes it is property by property and client by client, right? I mean, but we do try to formulate each property has a very definitive leasing plan and what we accept as for the tenant parameters, because based on fair housing laws, you cannot deviate from that at all. So- Right. So that's why we make sure that we're in a lot of our, a lot of like we use Yardy as our accounting and property management software. And a lot of our tenant requirements are already built into our system. So once we run credit and criminal background checks, the system automatically accepts or denies them. So, okay. So it's yeah. automated. It is automated. That probably it, gives you some legal protection. It does. That way it takes the emotion out of it, you know. Yeah, the decision, uh, it makes the decision for you. That's <clears throat> nice. Yeah, and man, programs, these programs have come around a long, long way just in the last five years. And so, like I said, through our Yardy programs, and a lot of that's just built into it. And so, and a lot of what we don't want to have happen is at the site levels, because most of what we manage, we have on-site managers, leasing agents, and maintenance personnel. We're just trying to take the guesswork for them out of the equation. Yeah, that's great. That's that's so good. So much good stuff. Yeah, I loved digging into 08. Your experience. I can talk for about that. These are some great topics that I don't get to talk about very often. Are you ready for our question round? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's jump in. The book you've recommended most over the last year. 
Oh, gosh. I don't want to be cliche and do rich dad, poor dad, but I, if someone's starting from like literally nothing then and, and they want to be in, interested in real estate, the two books I always recommend, obviously, is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But there's another one of my favorites that, gosh, I think got written somewhere in the 90s is Confessions of a Real Estate Entrepreneur. I used to make all my new agents read that. And basically, the book's about a guy that Actually, he was, I think his career was, he was an attorney, but he really did a lot of real estate deals and, and he talks through a lot of the deals that he's done through his career. And obviously a lot of them were big money makers. But back when I was referring that, there weren't as many books about people talking about, you know, all the deals that they had done. So Confessions of a Real Estate Entrepreneur would probably be the one I'd recommend. The one I recommend most now would be The One Thing. If, if Gary Keller, people, yeah, Gary Keller is the one thing. And only because I think it's so good and valuable for people that seem to be kind of lost or seem to be at the crossroads of where they need to go. And if someone calls or meets with me and says, hey, I just kind of need the direction, I always kind of refer them to that book. Oh, awesome. That's great. I like that book. That's really yeah, good. I love uh, an amazing too. book. Very good for me. Yeah. At the time. So. What was your most awkward year? I'd probably say I had to go back to 08, I guess. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah. And I would only say that from a standpoint that that would have been the first year that I really had to look at myself. I mean, I had been in the business at that point, probably almost 12 years. And that was the first year that I honestly didn't know exactly what I was going to do the next year. You know, sure. I, that's when I said I had to pivot at that point, I realized that going traditional routes of selling property and buying property wasn't as likely. And if I was going to make, you know, and I had not only my, my household to feed, but I had people who worked for me. And so, so yeah, I would say that that would have been an awkward year. I really had to do a lot of self-reflecting and pivoting and quite honestly, rolling my sleeves up and getting to work and not feeling sorry for all the things that might go or might happen or might not happen. And so, yeah, so we, we decided to launch in 09 and we completely pivoted and changed the way we were doing business development and people who we were going after. So yeah, I would say 08. So, okay. Awesome. Aside from real estate, one thing you could spend all day talking yeah, about. Yeah. I like scuba diving. I like water sports and uh, yeah, I love scuba diving. I haven't been in a little while, but man, I when I get to talking about that with some other People and yeah, I mean, we can sit here and talk about all the things that we've done and places we still like to go and scuba dive. And so, yeah, I, I really like, I like the water. I like being on the beach and it's a nice getaway from kind of where I currently live. So great. Is there a high school friend you want to say hello to? Yeah, I'd, I'd say three of them, Mike, Chuck, and Wayne, three guys I spent the most time in high school with. And we're actually <clears throat> about, hopefully about to get together and we're going to rent a lake house together in October and, and just meet for the weekend and, and probably have some good times like we used to. So Awesome. Mike, Chuck, and Wayne. I yeah. love it. And lastly, when are you happiest? When am I happiest? Or oh, uh, Probably when I'm on vacation. And, vacation? Uh, yeah, just finally. I, I, and a lot of it's mental. You know, when I decide to finally take a mental break from work and real estate, which I probably never really do. But even when I'm on vacation, we'll go and look at real estate and we'll check with the local market there. And I'll meet with some people that I know. And sometimes it's business oriented, but, but at least being away from the office when I'm on vacation just gives me time to relax and think and think about the next chapter and think about kind of where we want to head. So that's great. Love it. And lastly, uh, how can listeners reach out to you? They can contact me. Probably email is the easiest. That would be Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at Estes, E-S-T-E-S, -E group, G-R-O-U-P dot net, N-E-T. Email's best way. If, if you want to call me by phone, that would be 601-906-8999. Give out your phone number. Yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. Hey, this I'm has in the been great business. We got to got to do it. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. There was so much great content. I loved digging into, you know, like we said, 08 was fun yeah. and your management and, and It just uh, means I'm old. So it means we're old if we like Got talking. granular. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, awesome. This has yeah. been great. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate the uh, the invite to be on and uh, look forward to reconnecting soon. 
Yeah, likewise. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. All right cool. See ya. Thank you for joining us for the Wild West Real Estate Show. If you like what we're attempting to do here, please subscribe so we can continue sharing these with you. And if you want to check out our website, it's quantumcapitalinc.com. You'll find podcast episodes as well as multifamily properties we're looking at and how you could potentially participate. Look forward to seeing you guys soon on the Wild West Real Estate Show.